Welcome to Lecture 18 of Statistical Rethinking 2023. One of the difficulties in teaching this course is that I have to find a way to move your mind uh, from the narrow perspective of introductory statistics and help you see that those kinds of uh, approaches and models are very special cases. Um, it's not that the man is moving, uh, but the river. Uh, and once you realize things like this, lots of solutions to, well, ordinary, realistic scientific problems open up. There are still coding challenges, uh, but the conceptual part is the most important one. And that is to get your mind to move um, and stop seeing the river or the man. So in the previous uh, lecture, I showed you this much more realistic kind of analysis. Finally, uh, we're almost done with the course, uh, a data set that has lots of missing values. To remind you, this is the primate family tree. Uh, the ends of each branch there is a species, and the dots represent different variables. There are just three of them, and we'll become reacquainted with these variables later in the lecture. Uh, and where there are missing dots, there are missing values. Uh, we simply don't know the values for those particular species. They haven't been measured. And I like to think in the previous lecture when we spoke about measurement error that I started to convince you that um, an observed variable is a very unusual thing, which is to say an observed variable with no error or uncertainty of any kind. And in this lecture, I want to double down on that intuition and convince you that um, missing data is quite typical. In fact, it's the ordinary case. Uh, observed data, that is data that we treat as if it had no uncertainty at all, is a very special and unusual case in real research. Uh, sometimes it does occur because our measurement device is really, really good and we're measuring exactly what we want to measure, but most of the time we're just fooling ourselves into believing that we have measured something with no error at all. So measurement error in the previous lecture is a set of methods for confronting that directly when we have some information about the measurement process so that we can put bounds on the uncertainty of a measurement. And in this lecture, um, we're gonna think about data that are completely missing. That is, uh, we have no measurement at all of them uh, directly. And this is what is usually called missing data. That is, some cases are unobserved. Now, of course, um, uh, there could be whole individuals or cats or whatever it is you're measuring that are also unobserved, and you could also call those missing data, but we usually think of that as a sampling problem. Uh, but I think it'll start to soak in that it's really the same kind of problem, and we can approach it through probabilistic modeling as well. Uh, in either case, missing data are not really missing when you have a generative model. Because just like in the measurement error case, we do know something about them uh, because there are implications that come from the generative model for cases we have not observed. We know, for example, the constraints on the variable because we know something about the nature of the variable. Yeah? So uh, assume we were studying human height. Uh, you had measured a particular individual's height, uh, but you know that it's positive. Yeah, That's a constraint. You also know something about the valid ranges. It could be, it's not going to be seven meters. Yeah. The other thing you often know uh, about missing cases are their relationships to other variables. And you know these things through the causal model. And those implications uh, through probabilistic modeling can be very powerful and help you make use of the available measured data um, when otherwise people just tend to throw it away. So in this lecture, uh, I hope to show you how we approach this first conceptually. How do we think about um, drawing assumptions about missing data into causal models, um, and then talk about the sorts of procedures that people use to deal with missing data, because in most real research, you will have some. Uh, one of the things that's often done is simply to drop all cases, that would be species or countries or whatever it is, whatever the unit on each row is, uh, to drop all those cases that don't that aren't complete that have any missing values in the variables of interest. Um, and sometimes this can be justified, but it can only be justified through drawing causal assumptions. Yeah, so there's just no way out of it. Uh, and the same causal assumptions that will allow you to drop 
cases with missing values will also permit you to do something called imputation, which allows you to make use of the present cases, uh, that is the observed variables for the cases that have some incomplete values, and therefore recover some efficiency in estimating some of the parameters in the model. Let's start with the concepts uh, up through the break, and then after the break, we'll do some calculations. Okay, so let's, let's think about a totally abstract um, parable about missing data now. Uh, let's suppose, uh, as is often rumored, um, that students don't like to do their homework, and sometimes the homework uh, is not turned in. And there are various reasons for this. Um, so we're going to uh, look at a simple DAG here where there are students and they cause homework and we're interested in the quality of homework from different students. Uh, that is in grading them. Uh, but we don't get to observe all homework from all students because some students just don't turn it in. We don't know how good their work would have been if they had done it. Um, so I'm going to draw the dotted circle around homework, meaning we haven't observed the true vector of homework values. Instead, we've observed this descendant of it, h star, which is also a vector, but it's got missing values in it. That is, the students who didn't turn in their homework, there are just blanks in there. Um, this is what we usually mean when we say missing values. We've observed for some cases and not observed for others. Now, what can be done about this? Should we just ignore the students um, who have not turned in homework? What should we think counterfactually about their homework? Well, it depends upon what we believe is causing homework to go missing. Let's consider the simplest case. Say the students say, my dog ate my homework. Here's the dog. This is a mechanism that leads to homework to going missing. Uh, and so the, um, the descendant h star, the vector of homeworks with missing values, is influenced both by the true homework yeah, that was submitted or would have been submitted had the stu student done it, uh, and the dog that eats homework. Yeah. Um, and in this particular DAG, I want you to pay attention to the dog. Uh, that is the missingness mechanism uh, in general. Uh, and what is influencing the homework that the dog eats? Uh, and in this particular case, the dog is, as we say, random. Uh, there are no uh, to figure out if there's any bias that will arise from the missingness in analyzing um, only the present samples, we need to, well, obey the do calculus. Uh, uh, analyze the graph with your eyes and think about biasing paths. Is there any biasing path connecting the homework um, to the cause of interest, the treatment of interest, that is, the student's ability, S? Uh, and there isn't. Uh, there isn't. And I'll show you an example in the next slide where there is. And, and you'll see how to work with that. But in this case, there's not because the dog is just like a competing cause. Um, it eats homework at random. It's not influenced by the student's ability. Uh, and we don't expect a bias uh, in most cases uh, in this circumstance. Uh, so we say that the dog, the random dog is usually benign. I do say usually because in particular uh, measurements, uh, sometimes even randomness can be bad. Um, Here's a simple simulation, uh, so you can play with this and think about this causally. Uh, there's a hundred students and a hundred dogs. I uh, simulate uh, standardized student abilities in variable s, and then their homeworks are correlated with their abilities. And then um, the dog eats 50% of the homework totally at random, without any regard for the quality of the homework, uh, as dogs do. And then we have an observed variable h star, which has missing those missing values in it. And we can plot. And what I'm showing you on the right is um, the total sample in black. Those are, that's the total sample. And then the uh, incomplete sample uh, in red. And uh, if we draw regression lines through these, um, uh, you'll see that the slopes are about the same on average. Uh, and you can run multiple simulations here to play around with this and reassure yourself I haven't picked any special simulation. We don't expect a bias from missingness when the dogs are random like this. We do lose data though, uh, and that's not good. So we lose efficiency and we lose precision. Okay, let's modify the parable of the dog and the homework. Um, and let's draw an arrow from student ability uh, to the dog. That is that the dog is influenced um, 
by uh, the student's ability. Uh, maybe, for example, uh, students who study a lot and work really hard on their homework and don't pay enough attention to their dogs. This makes the dogs grumpy and the dogs eat the homework more as an act of revenge. Yeah. Um, this is a possibly biasing path. Uh, we're ignoring the missingness mechanism. That is, the reasons the dog eats some homework and not other uh, could result in um, confounding in the general sense, uh, plain English sense that I often use it, meaning that you will be misled. Uh, so this is a possibly biasing path. The way you could think about this kind of DAG is that the dog eats conditional on the cause of homework. Yeah, some cause. It doesn't have to be the student. Uh, but the, the student in this case is the cause we're interested in, and so this is the most alarming uh, sort of situation. So this can be benign, yeah, but it, I'm going to show you benign case and then a less benign case. It, it depends upon uh, the measurement scales and the functions that relate the variables. Unfortunately, it's, it's um, uh, uh, you just have to think harder about the generative process in this business. So again, a simulation, 100 students, 100 dogs, 100 homeworks. Um, same relationship between student ability and homework quality. Now the dog is going to eat 80% of the homework, but only when, but only for students who are above average. That is S greater than zero. Uh, and because they neglect to play with their dogs. And then we plot, and uh, what I want you to see is the black points, the total sample, um, are showing on the higher values of S because the red values, the observed sample, has been depleted in that range. I'll say this again. The black points for the total sample are showing in the on the right-hand side of that graph for students above average ability because the observed sample, the red points, have been depleted in that range. Um, now for linear functions, like I've assumed here, you see the two regression lines. Um, doesn't have much of an effect, right? Because it's linear. It doesn't matter what value of S is. There's the same relationship uh, to the quality of the homework on the vertical. But that's a special case that has to do with the functions I've chosen here. And the linear additive case is sort of the most benign sort of situation you could assume, which is why people often assume it. But it's very implausible uh, for lots of situations, including homework, right? So uh, let's imagine something a little more realistic, that as student ability goes up, uh, there's a ceiling effect on the quality of the homework. Right? Eventually, uh, you just get everything right on the homework, and it can't get any better. Right? We're not grading on penmanship here. So now, uh, the dog eats the homework of students who study too much, just as before, but there's a nonlinear ceiling effect on, the, on homework. Uh, I've chosen a particular um, exponential function for this just to make it curve. So if you... Uh, look at the black points plus the red points, that's the total sample, and you'll see how it um, uh, eventually homework start, stops getting uh, better with increasing S. Yeah, it left, starts to level off. Now we deplete the sample again for the students of high ability because their dogs are upset with them. It's an act of vengeance. And we observe the red points and we fit straight lines. Uh, and you'll see uh, uh, we do get the wrong answer here because we're using the wrong function. Yeah, so this is just to remind you that part of the generative, the reason we go from DAGs and then write generative models with functions is because the functions matter. Okay, this can unfortunately get worse um, and often is worse in real data. Now let's draw an arrow from the homework itself to the dog. Uh, what could this possibly mean? Well, uh, say the dogs have a preference for uh, a certain quality of homework, uh, bad or good. Um, uh, in particular, say students who do bad homework and are aware of this tend to feed their homework to their dogs. Now it's the quality of the homework uh, moderated by the students uh, who, um, who, that cause a certain homework to go missing. This situation is very bad. Yeah, so now you've got a biasing path for sure. Uh, and unless you can model the dog, uh, you can't close it. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, um, the dog eats conditional on homework itself. This situation is usually not benign. In fact, it's, the, it's a kind of nightmare of statistical um, contexts. And uh, 
uh, again, a simulation on the left. Uh, I chose linear functions again. We'll go back to the simple case, but now what's leading the dog? Uh, the dog eats 90% of homework where the homework is below average. Yeah, so students are feeding their, their below average homework assignments to their dogs. And we plot again on the right, and um, the black plus the red is the total sample. And we only observe the red because the bad homeworks on the bottom half of the graph, bottom half of the y-axis, uh, are depleted. And we fit two lines and we get a bias. Yeah, I hope this is intuitive to you. It, it, it tends to make more sense. Uh, this situation is very hard to recover from unless you can model the missingness mechanism and you know something about the functional forms. Let me try to summarize. These are three idealized cases, and they are uh, certainly not all the situations you can be in because you know, DAG can get complicated and you can have missingness in multiple ones. And and uh, so don't think this is the universe of things, but these are the stereotype cases, and you want to start by being easy on yourself and learning the stereotype cases so you can uh, scaffold up uh, your conception of the problems. So the first one I showed you at the top here is the what I call dog eats random homework. Uh, sometimes in stats this is called missing completely at random, uh, but that's not a very memorable phrase. Think about the dog. The dog eats random homework. In this case, in this sort of situation, if you want to drop incomplete cases, that is um, uh, cases where there are missing values, that's usually okay. That won't result in a bias, but it does result in a loss of efficiency. If we had other variables here we needed to adjust by, uh, we would be throwing away um, information that lets us estimate coefficients for those adjustments. Yeah, uh, and that's that's a shame. We want to use all the information on the table, um, but it's not wrong uh, to drop in complete cases. Uh, number two, uh, dog eats conditional on cause. Uh, again, in stats, this is dreadfully sometimes called missing at random, um, which again, is completely uninformative sort of name. Uh, think about the dog. The dog is eating and it's conditional on a cause, uh, some variable that we have observed, yeah, a treatment or something we want to adjust by. And what we need to do is we can need to condition on that cause or stratify um, uh, by that covariate in order to deal with with the missingness, uh, but we must model it correctly. And that was the point of my example where there were diminishing returns on the quality of homework. There's no, there's no get out of jail free card here. And then finally, uh, level three of the inferno, I hope you never find yourself here. Uh, the outcome of interest itself is uh, causing missingness and it's extremely difficult to deal with situations like this, but they're not rare. Now the dog story is obviously um, uh, comic. Yeah, it's meant to uh, entertain you and draw your attention and be memorable. Uh, so you can come back to these stereotype cases. But there are lots of variables which are um, which cause them where their own value causes them to go missing. I'll say that again. There are lots of variables where the value itself increases the probability that you will not observe it. Uh, think about income. You're trying to do a survey on income. And people in certain income ranges will be motivated either to refuse to answer or to lie. Yeah. Uh, now, a lie is not missing. Uh, you might call it measurement error, uh, but that just makes it worse than missing in many ways. Um, uh, this sort of thing is not so unusual, unfortunately. Uh, I say at the bottom of this slide, um, this is usually hopeless. Uh, that's the word that I don't tend to like to use because I'm a hopeful person, but uh, this is usually hopeless. You just want to report it honestly that this is a likely thing and describe the sample you have and say you can't draw causal conclusions because of the missingness. That would be the honest thing to do, I think, in most cases. But there are times um, where hope springs forth and you can do something about it if you know enough about the missingness mechanism. A, a really common case of this is survival analysis. I had a bonus in an earlier lecture when we analyzed the black cat adoptions um, which use survival analysis. And in survival analysis, we, we nearly always have missing values. Um, there are adoptions which have not happened yet. Uh, and But we know enough about the missingness mechanism and we have... Um, strong enough distributional assumptions about the, the adoptions that haven't happened yet that we can recover uh, those cases and we can do something about it. So it's not always hopeless. So what do we do? 
in those cases? Well, in all those cases, in the standard middle case, uh, dog eats random homework, dog eats conditional on cause, um, and, and exotic cases like survival analysis, what we want to do is something called imputation or um, a, a more mathematical trick which, which achieves the same goal but just avoids having to develop probability distributions for the variables themselves, something called marginalization. What does this mean? Bayesian imputation, it means we compute a posterior probability distribution for each missing value. Remember, in Bayes, an unobserved variable is a parameter, yeah, and, and the special rare case is a perfectly observed um, variable. We'd call that data. But data is in the minority in, in science, right? Usually, we have imperfect measurements, and those things require distributions. Uh, Information goes into those distributions, of course, and gives us priors. But then we then we need to update through a generative model. Um, so we're going to do Bayesian imputation in this lecture, and I'll show you how it works. Uh, in in principle, you've already done Bayesian imputation in this course when we did multi-level models. Uh, remember the Bangladesh fertility example? There was a district which we had no data for, but we nevertheless got a prediction for it. That was Bayesian imputation. Uh, it just happens automatically, and, and I'll show you some examples after the break. Um, the next uh, uh, sort of thing which achieves the same result is this thing called marginalizing unknowns. Um, often we don't really care about the posterior probability distributions of the missing data, but we want to um, leverage probability theory so that we can use the efficiency in all of the observed data without throwing away incomplete cases. And in that case, we can do this marginalization trick. We don't have to bother with computing posterior probability distributions uh, for those uh, for the unobserved cases, the unobserved values. Instead, we can just sort of average over them using the probability distributions of the other variables. Uh, I know that sounds weird, um, but it's it's uh, an automatic sort of thing you can do uh, with with probability models. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And in principle, you've done it in the uh, previous lecture in the misclassification uh, example. I just didn't call it that. OK, why does Bayesian imputation work? Um, this idea that we can compute the posterior distribution of the uh, uh, unobserved uh, values. Well, because if you have a causal model of all the variables, and that's what a Bayesian generative model is, it's a joint probabilistic model of all the variables at once. Um, then there will be implications for the values that are missing because uh, the available evidence uh, gives you probability distributions for the coefficients that tell you how the variables are related to one another, how they're associated. And that lets you do the imputation and lets you put bounds on the plausible values of the unobserved, um, of the unobserved variables. Uh, Conceptually, uh, this is weird, uh, but uh, uh, technically it's even weirder. So I'm going to go slow here, uh, but uh, don't worry. This is a, a very common sort of thing to do. It's not at all avant-garde. Um, so sometimes you don't need to do imputation at all. It's just unnecessary. So if you have discrete parameters, um, for example, then we almost never bother with imputation. Uh, and it's, it's quite expensive and, and difficult to do the sampling anyway. And so the misclassification example in the previous lecture was a sort of covert example of this, where I had missing uh, X values. That was the um, extra pair paternity assignment of each child. Uh, and I didn't bother to compute probability distributions for those. I just, I just averaged over them using that little probability tree. That's marginalization. Sometimes you want to do imputation, though, because it's actually easier than the marginalization. And one example of this is actually in survival analysis with censored observations. Um, if you have a complicated hazard function, the hazard function is what determines um, the uh, scheduling of the event, uh, that is time to event. If it's at all complicated, something more than a simple exponential, um, the marginalization can be very computationally difficult and sometimes quite unstable. And in those cases, it's actually easier to treat the censored cases as missing values and model them uh, as parameters. Um, and there's an example, a coded example, of how to do this in the script that goes with this lecture. Uh, for marginalization, there's a fully worked example in the book, and I apologize for not putting this in this lecture, but this lecture would be three hours if I did all the interesting material in the missing um, in the missing data chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, it just has to be this way. 
Uh, but please take a look at that. It, it, we start with the generative model and we build up to the marginalization code and talk about um, numeric stability issues and the whole thing. The focal data example for this lecture is just going to be uh, the primates uh, data from the previous lecture, but now we're going to deal with the missing data and we're going to revisit that analysis and we're going to do imputation for the half the data that are missing. Uh, and you might be saying, but that's a lot of data. Can we really do that? Of course you can. Remember, in Bayes, the minimum sample size is one or actually zero because you get predictions just from the priors. Uh, the, and this, all of this also goes for imputation. There's no magic number which tells you how much data you're allowed to impute. Yeah, um, if you don't learn anything from the sample, then the posterior won't be different from the prior, and we can always check that. Uh, so just relax uh, and trust the axioms. Yeah. Uh, to remind you about this data, we've got 301 primate species, lots of missing data in the three variables of interest, that is mass, body mass in grams, uh, brain volume in cubic centimeters, and uh, typical social group size. Um, there's also measurement error here, uh, and uh, lots of potential for unobserved confounding. I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about this sample again conceptually before we get back to the data. Uh, so remind you what the tree looks like. I started the lecture with this picture. It's the 301 species. If we did a complete case analysis, which is what we did before, then we end up dropping um, half the species, and this is what we're left to analyze, just those. And you see you end up with big gaps in certain parts of the trees uh, because there are some species which are just not so glamorous as apes. Apes are quite well measured, but uh, even in the apes, we're missing a lot of data. So we're going to impute some primates. Uh, the key idea, uh, as I keep saying, but maybe it's good to hear it over and over again, is that we already have probabilistic information about missing values because of the relationships um, among observed values in the sample. And that lets us leverage all the data that we have observed, right? So say there's a species where we haven't measured uh, body mass, but we've measured uh, their group size. We want to use that group size to inform uh, the coefficients in the model, not throw it away. And the imputation will let us do that. And the good news is it sort of happens automatically from the same statistical model. Uh, you don't have to really do anything different writing the mathematical version of the stat model uh, to justify imputation. Because in Bayes, there's, there's no deep conceptual distinction between data and parameter. A missing value will be a parameter. An observed value will be called data. But they're just observed and unobserved. That's all there is. Yeah. Um, and so uh, whether something's a prior or a likelihood is, uh, well, that's whether the river is moving or the man is running in it. Yeah, it's your mind that moves, uh, not the distribution. Um, so let's take you through this. And as I say at the bottom of this slide, uh, this is conceptually weird, uh, but you get used to that in a little while, right? Do your Zen meditation, uh, think about the man in the river catching fish, it, it'll come to you. You can, you can pivot your mind's eye back and forth between the, the duality of, of parameters and data. Um, the coding is awkward, and there's just no way around being honest about that. I will always be honest with you. Uh, the coding's awkward. It just is. And uh, sometimes packages will hide this from you, and that's great. Um, uh, but at some point, uh, you have to face that technical awkwardness, and there's just no way around it. But we'll worry about that after the break, the technical awkwardness. Before the break here, uh, we're not long from the break, let's just focus on the conceptual issues of drawing the missingness into this particular case. Okay, to remind you, here's the dag I had drawn in the previous lecture where, um, uh, actually it wasn't the previous lecture, it was like two lectures ago. Uh, uh, we've got group size and brain size and body mass. Uh, and there's some uh, evolutionary history, which is uh, influencing a bunch of unobserved confounds, and that was the justification for including phylogeny, uh, and we used the Gaussian process to do that. Um, however, uh, all three of these variables, group size and body mass and brain size, have missing values, and so what we want to do is draw that on the DAG. We haven't observed the full G vector. We've only observed G star which is group size with missing values, and it's influenced by some missingness mechanism, which I write here as little m sub g. Now, what is influencing missingness? The typical assumption is that it's totally random, but that's very unlikely 
in evolutionary ecology studies. Yeah, uh, we know scientists don't study species at random. And so the species we have data for are a non-random sample of, of all the primates. Uh, so for example, there's a very strong bias uh, among primatologists to study species that are closely related to humans. Why? Well, because we're basically narcissists, right? And uh, that's the whole premise of my field of anthropology. It's, it's a deeply seated and unembarrassed narcissism. Um, but the consequence here is that it means um, the, the smaller and, and less related to humans a primate gets, the, the greater the probability we're missing some, some variable for it. Uh, another possibility um, is that uh, larger species uh, are just easier to observe. And so body mass uh, is one of the other variables in the data, like body mass might influence missingness on group size. So for small, imagine small body primates, um, they live in trees, they're hard to observe. We don't know their group sizes. Yeah, that, that seems plausible as well. But for something large like a chimpanzee, um, they're easy to spot. You can count them. Uh, you know how many chimps are in a group. Another possibility, just to give you night terrors, is that the variable itself, group size in this case, influences its own missingness. Uh, and uh, what would that mean, for example? Well, imagine solitary species are less studied, and so uh, we don't know their group sizes. Yeah, uh, These sorts of things can happen, and so they're worth considering. And maybe you know enough scientifically that you can reject this option, uh, but it's, it's the sort of thing that is an assumption yeah, and it's an assumption that can't easily be tested with the sample. So um, all these arrows are potentially in play. Uh, whatever assumption you end up making, um, what you need to do is use the causal model to justify an analysis procedure. Yeah, to build some, either you uh, admit defeat and simply describe the sample and don't claim that anything, any causal estimates can be made, or you argue that here are the assumptions that are necessary to interpret um, the results as causal. These are all good options. You just want to put your assumptions on the table because assumptions are what license conclusions. Yeah. If your conclusions would hold under any assumption, that doesn't sound like a conclusion, does it? Um, uh, arguments always depend on their premises. So lay out your assumptions, lay out your premises, um, let your colleagues inspect them. I'm not meaning to argue here for any particular version of this DAG because I don't know what causes the missing values in this sample. Um, I just gave you some hypotheses. But I want to show you if you were willing to say it was something like um, evolutionary history or body mass is influencing missingness and group size, uh, then we can proceed. Yeah, but only because um, we have drawn out those assumptions and we can uh, prove uh, that um, there's a way forward from there using the generative model and testing the analysis pipeline. Um, the reason we can make progress is because once you've got the generative model uh, and, and you program this as a probabilistic model, um, the missing values, even though they're uncertain, that uncertainty will cascade through the whole model in exactly the right way. You don't need to be clever or intuit how this works. Just trust the axioms um, and uh, all of the con necessary constraints on the information will be obeyed um, and uh, the posterior distribution will take it all into account. So with that, I think we should pause uh, and I really encourage you to review the first half of this lecture before you continue after the pause. Uh, this is conceptually strange. I admit that uh, it took me a long time to wrap my head around missing data and imputation when I started this. So I'm completely sympathetic to that. Um, so do the review, jot down what's confusing. You can bring that confusion to me if you can't resolve it on your own uh, and then take a break, take care of yourself. And when you come back, I will still be here. Before the break, I had um, 
added missing values to group size, um, but obviously all three of these variables, uh, m, g, and b, have missing values, so I've added uh, the analogs for them, a b star for the observed brain sizes and an m star for the observed body masses, and then missingness mechanisms for each of them. Uh, and if we assume that missingness is totally at random, that is there are no causes into those uh, little m variables on the graph, uh, we know uh, a model that will uh, deal with this because we did it um, back in the Gaussian process lecture when I introduced phylogenetic regression. Uh, we will have a covariance kernel k that is informed by the phylogenetic distances d uh, among the species that we get from the uh, consensus primate phylogeny. And then we stratify um, by body mass because uh, we believe it is a confound, right? It's, a, it's at the middle of a fork um, between uh, G and B. Okay, that's just review. Uh, if we were only modeling uh, it this way, this is the sort of reduced graph in the way you think about it, that um, uh, G and M are uh, influencing B. This is like a sub-model of the whole thing, the only part, the only causes that we're interested in, right? We're not modeling the influence of body mass on group size, and so the DAG at the top of the screen has deleted all the arrows that are not represented in this statistical model. And we don't necessarily need them, right? The Duke calculus says we don't need to estimate those relationships uh, given our assumptions. Um, to estimate the influence of group size on brain size. Um, but to do imputation, well, often we need the whole graph uh, and the other relationships because the DAG simultaneously implies um, a uh, uh, relationships among the other variables, right? We can focus instead on a different estimate on group size and the influence of body mass on it, and it will also be confounded um, by phylogeny uh, or evolutionary history and shared environments, uh, lowercase u, in this graph. And so there would be another simultaneous phylogenetic regression that we could run to estimate that, the influence of body mass on group size. Uh, and, um, of course, there is also the influence of evolutionary history on body mass itself. Uh, neither G or B, uh, by assumption in this example, influences body mass, but uh, evolutionary history does. And so we might want to estimate that as well. This would be, uh, for, for the evolutionary biologists, this would be an example of trying to measure the phylogenetic signal on body mass. All three of these regressions, uh, big Gaussian process regressions, coexist simultaneously in the DAG. And we can run them simultaneously, and that will be the way we will do imputation on these things at the same time uh, and be uh, perfectly uh, uh, compatible with the assumptions in the causal model. And any other approach, um, any other ad hoc approach to doing this is going to go wrong somewhere. Yeah. And this is a point at which I want to point out too that even though I'm using the word imputation, and this is a word that's used in non Bayesian missing data methods as well, what we're doing is different. Uh, non Bayesian imputation does not involve assigning probability distributions to unobserves, right? Because they don't do that. Um, it involves simulating data sets using a generative model and then running the analysis multiple times. We're not going to do that. We're going to run the analysis once, and we're going to get posterior distributions for all the unobserved simultaneously, um, compatible with the generative assumptions. Okay, a model like this, three simultaneous Gaussian processes, is not something to take lightly. You don't want to try and build it up all at once. You want to take small steps, and even then, you're going to fall down. Uh, making these models is hard. It's hard for everybody when you start out. So you take tiny little steps. Uh, you want a friend walking beside you the first time you try it. And even then, you might fall down, uh, stumble a bit. Uh, and when your friend laughs, uh, they're not laughing at you. They're laughing with you, and they're there to pick you up. Uh, eventually, you can build it all together and practice and get it to run. Um, and in our business, we all fall down, so don't feel bad. So we're going to take it slow. I'm not going to draw the whole owl at once here. I'm going to draw little subcomponents of this model and build it up and remind you um, 
if I were doing this as part of a research project, I would also have a generative simulation with synthetic data, and I would be testing each little step of building the estimator of, of the statistical model as well. I have to leave that out of this lecture because it would be three hours long, um, but that's the sort of thing that's really worth doing. Uh, it's not a trivial case to do a synthetic simulation of phylogenetic data, uh, but there are packages to help you do that. Okay, we're gonna go slow. The first thing we're gonna do is we're just going to ignore all the cases with missing brain values. Why? Well, that's the outcome and the species with missing brain values, the model will at the end uh, be able to make predictions for those, but we don't anticipate getting any value out of imputing uh, the missing cases uh, in the outcome. Those are just predictions, yeah? Um, we will then want to impute GNM uh, ignoring the models for each, which is almost certainly the wrong thing to do, but I want to show it to you because, first of all, this is how you build up code. You start with things that are slightly wrong but have some structure to them so you can get the, get the machine running, and then you add in the complexity and layers. Uh, it will also turn out to be very useful for showing you the consequences of adding the causes of GNM into the imputation. You'll understand this when I get there. Um, so then we get to step three and we impute group size using the model and you'll see the consequences of that. What I mean by using the model is using the causes of G, which is um, both body mass and evolutionary history. And then finally we'll get to step four and we'll do it all. Yeah, and I'll show you uh, the results that arise from all of that. I will not walk you through the detailed code of the last model because it would take up multiple screens, uh, but all the code is in the script for this lecture. So what does it mean, ignore cases with missing p-values? Well, um, we can take a look at what's missing here. So here's a table uh, where we see um, what's present uh, for all the complete cases where brain size is present. And you'll see that uh, there are patterns of missingness as well, what we're left with after we reduce ourselves down um, to all the species where we have observed brain sizes. Uh, you can see that um, what this little table does uh, uh, is um, true means observed uh, and, and uh, false means missing. Uh, so you can see that um, uh, we're missing a lot of values uh, for group size. Yeah, and uh, there's some correlation in missingness as well in these variables. But this is what we're left with. You get that 151 number, that's the case where both M and G are observed and that's what we saw before. Uh, so now let's impute group size and body mass, ignoring the models for each. What do I mean by that? Well, what I've got on the screen right now is the full thing, the full luxury base approach we're gonna end the lecture with. When I ignore the models, that means I just treat G and M as if they were standard normals. Yeah, uh, no causes at all. Um, this is not the right answer, but this is almost always the right place to start when building a fancy model like this. And go easy on yourself because you're going to slip on the ice, okay? Uh, Got to take small steps or, or your fall is going to hurt a lot more. Uh, so when GI is observed, this is the thing to think about this distribution, normal zero one that's assigned to G sub I. Some of the G sub I values have been observed, they're measurements. So when it's observed, uh, conventional statisticians would call this a likelihood. It's a likelihood for a standardized variable. Yeah, it gives us the probability of observing that measurement. Uh, it's okay to assign it to standardized because we can just standardize group size, right? Um, when uh, G sub I is missing, however, uh, since we're Bayesians, we get to call this the prior. Uh, but again, this is your mind moving, not the variable. Yeah, is the, is the man moving or is the stream moving? Um, these categories, uh, likelihood and prior, are features of our mind. They're not features of probability theory. And we can exploit that dualism. Uh, we only need one definition, whether um, G is observed or missing. It's just that sometimes when it's missing, there's a parameter in that place. Um, and so we will get a posterior distribution for it. And uh, in this case, normal zero one will be the prior for it. And, uh, but that will not necessarily be the posterior. It'll, it'll get updated. Um, and uh, when it's observed, it'll inform uh, the coefficient uh, for it, uh, for that variable. 
So this looks like a, a typical, uh, this is the same kind of code we used in the, the Gaussian process lecture. This is a Gaussian process regression where the phylogenetic distance matrix there is DMAT. Um, and uh, no surprises, I hope. Uh, you run this and you get a huge vector of imputed values. You get two imputed body masses. Remember, there's only two missing body masses in these. Uh, in this case, body mass is, is much more uh, often measured. It's easier to measure than group size because it's not a behavior. And, uh, and then a bunch of missing group sizes uh, you see there. Uh, that have been imputed as well. And you don't want to stare too hard at this table because it'll drive you to madness. Yeah, that's not how we uh, interpret the outcomes of these things. But we want to plot posterior uh, predictions. Yeah. And so let's do that. Uh, so think about body mass on the horizontal here um, uh, versus brain volume on the vertical. And what's the relationship between these things? And you see the black points of the observed cases. There's a very strong correlation between body size and brain size. This is totally unsurprising because bigger bodies have bigger brains. Um, and the imputed values there, I'm showing you the posterior distributions for the imputed values in red. And each of those is a single point. Remember, there's only two. Uh, and the circle is the posterior mean. And then I think those are 89% uh, intervals. And you'll see they follow the trend. Yeah. Uh, even though they both had the same normal zero one prior, and that's because the coefficient was estimated, and so the imputed values uh, follow the trend. Yeah, because we know the brain volume uh, for the species, and that gives us information about its body mass. Now, what about the relationship between body mass and group size? Uh, the model we just ran is silent on this because there's no coefficient to connect these two variables, even though we believe body mass is related to, to group size. It's certainly strongly associated in the sample. And you can see that in the plot on this graph in the black points. That's the raw data. Um, these are, there is an association. It's not nearly as strong as the association between body mass and brain size, but they're associated. But look at the imputed values in red. Those are just posterior means. Uh, each of those is an uncertain point. Uh, remember that. But these are the posterior means for ease of visualization. And you'll see they don't follow uh, the, the association trend between these two variables. Uh, we've left some information on the table. And this is a consequence of ignoring the full generative model. Yeah. And so we're going to fold that uh, information in now by updating the generative, putting the generative model into the, into the statistical model. And this this will change. Okay, what happens to the um, estimated causal effect of group size on brain size as a consequence of this imputation? Well, it gets a lot smaller, actually. Um, as you see here, the black posterior distribution on the right is the so-called complete case analysis. That's what we did in the previous lecture. And the red is after we've done this imputation. This is the kind of thing I would call naive imputation because it ignores the relationships among the right-hand side variables. We just treated them as uh, normal zero one one in the prior. And that's almost certainly a mistake because the DAG says it's a mistake. But this is the first step. It's still right to do this first both because it helps you get the code to work. Remember the bear on the ice, take small steps, you will fall down. Um, uh, but also because then we can later compare and we can learn from that comparison. So let's do that. Let's it's still going to ignore body mass for the moment, but uh, remember small steps. We're going to add the generative model for group size, which means I'm, we're going to fill in the regression in the middle here, the center column so that um, there's a coefficient for the effect of body mass on group size. And again, we have a phylogenetic covariance matrix, but it's a different one, right, with its own parameters, but it uses the same distance matrix, the, the so-called phyletic distances among the species. Um, but it has its own parameters. See, they all have sub-G on them. And that's because the phylogenetic signature for, for different traits can be different. Okay. And now we uh, run this, um, and uh, um, on the uh, top, I do it uh, without phylogeny, which is to say uh, body mass is influencing group size, um, but we don't. Uh, but I don't worry about phylogenetic confounding on group size. We ignore that issue. Uh, so there's only one um, covariance kernel in there. Yeah, one one Gaussian process line. Uh, in the middle. And uh, so that's this model here. Yeah, you can see the model on G. 
the brain model's just above it. Um, and it's just an ordinary normal regression. It's not one of those multi-normal Gaussian process monsters. Yeah. So again, this is not where we wanted to be, but we take it step by step and you would do the top model here and get that to run and mix. And then you would put in um, the uh, Gaussian process. And that's what I have at the bottom down here where I convert that G tilde normal to G tilde multinormal. And we have another um, Gaussian process covariance kernel KG this time the covariance kernel for group size. And it looks the same, but it has its own parameters. Yeah, that weird rep vector thing in the middle is, uh, we just want the means uh, uh, here um, to be zero. Yeah, so, so that there's just phylogeny in this example so that I can contrast the two. Again, this is not where we wanna be because I've taken out the influence of body mass in the bottom model. Um, but this will let me contrast the effects of considering phylogeny versus the effects of considering just body mass. And then we can combine these two things in the same model uh, just by putting the, the line from the top, the new is AG plus BMG times M into the bottom model as well and get them. So I'll show you all the combinations. And again, I apologize for uh, taking all these tiny steps. Well, actually, I don't apologize at all. I'm not sorry at all. Uh, I'm taking all these tiny steps with different submodels because this is the way you should develop stuff. Even though you know where you want to be, but you can't get there right away. It, it would, you, would, you would take too big a step and you'd always fall down. Okay. So let me show you. Uh, this is what we had before, this relationship between body mass and group size. The black points are the observed values. The red points are the posterior means of the imputed values. This is obviously not so great. Yeah, it'd be nice if they followed the trend. Um, so let's do that. <clears throat> let's layer in on the right. I'm going to layer in uh, the other effects. Here are the imputed values, the posterior means of the imputed values for uh, the model that only considers the influence of body mass on group size, ignoring phylogeny. You can see now it captures the trend. Yeah, it follows a, a regression line that's uh, clumsily drawn through all those points. Yeah. But notice it, it's, it's still quite weird in the sense that group size has a very weird distribution. And this is one of the issues uh, because there are uh, lots of solitary species there at the bottom. Yeah, uh, those are the ones at the bottom. Those are the, the ones that, that where um, adult females live alone. Those are what we call solitary in primatology. And there are a lot of uh, solitary uh, prosimians. So um, also some apes. Yeah. And... Uh, our imputed values are not doing a very good job of accommodating that sort of thing. That's not too surprising, but it's the sort of thing you want to remark on. Um, then we consider phylogeny only, ignoring the influence of body mass. And these are the blue points. These are the posterior means of imputed values using phylogenetic covariance. And that is when we don't know, haven't observed um, uh, the group size for a particular species, uh, the imputation of its group size is informed more by its close relatives on the phylogeny. I'll say that again. When we haven't observed the group size for a particular species, the imputed value is informed more by its close relatives on the tree. And now you see there's a lot more structure here. Yeah, and this is because there's a lot of phylogenetic signal uh, on these things. And so um, uh, it, it captures a regression relationship without assuming anything about a linear relationship between these two variables. It's just the information in the phylogeny. So here's the way you can think about that. Uh, we plot the, um, uh, the OU, uh, uh, ornstein uhlenbeck um, Gaussian process kernel uh, here, and you see that there's a lot of phylogenetic signature um, for uh, group size uh, in these data. And that's why the imputations for uh, nearby species are, are hugging one another so much in the graph on the right, the blue points on the right. Um, okay, now purple points. I know this is one of the uh, uh, uglier, if not ugliest, um, data visualizations I've ever done in this class. I'm always trying to outdo myself. Uh, the, uh, remember to remind you, the red is the relationship that ignores phylogeny, uh, only um, pays attention to the influence of body mass. The uh, blue is only phylogeny, ignoring body mass. And now purple is phylogeny plus body mass, right? It's blue plus uh, red, which is purple. And uh, you see this is very much like uh, the phylogeny uh, part because the, the phylogenetic covariance is so strong, it really dominates the imputations here.
yeah, it moves a little bit. You see the purple points are moved a little bit towards the what you might call the regression line, but um, the phylogenetic information really dominates imputation here. And that's not that wasn't our assumption, right? It's it's a natural consequence of the generative model. So now let's summarize the uh, uh, inference uh, of all of this. And you remember. Um, in the previous lecture, when we only did the complete case analysis, that's the what I call observed here, the black posterior distribution. That was the largest effect, uh, strong effect of group size on brain size. And um, uh, the different kinds of imputation models uh, only reduce this. Um, the one that reduces it the most uh, is the one that ignores phylogeny. And as you add in phylogeny, um, it moves it up a bit. Uh, but overall, doing the right thing, the honest thing in imputation, um, reduces the strength of the evidence that there's a strong causal relationship between group size and brain size. Okay, we're not done. Yeah, so now we need to do the M model too, because body mass also has phylogenetic signature. So to remind you, uh, so the left column, that's the model we started with. This is the brain size model. It's the model from the Gaussian process lecture, uh, really. The center column is the model we just focused on, where we're modeling the influence of body mass on group size and simultaneously the phylogenetic signal um, to deal with phylogenetic confounding between these variables. And now on the right, uh, to get the body mass imputations, right, we also want to think about phylogenetic sig signal, and we can do that at the same time. So this is a very big model. I'm not going to show it to you, uh, but it's in the script uh, for this lecture. And, um, and here's what we get. Um, if you want to see the details of this, it's in the script, as I said, uh, at the top of this slide, I'm showing you posterior distributions for the regression effects. And I'm contrasting the complete case analysis uh, to the full luxury imputation, but on the same model. So when I say complete cases, I mean, um, the full model that considers um, phylogenetic covariance matrices for all three variables, for brain size, for body mass, and for group size simultaneously. And um, I show that uh, in black in each case, and then the red is the full luxury imputation. So on the, in the top left, you see uh, the, the effect of interest, as it were, the one that motivated uh, this example. What's the effect of group size on brain size? And it's essentially unchanged for the complete case analysis. Yeah. Uh, so you might feel a little disappointed, say you went through all that effort and you got the same result. Um, but listen, uh, this is duty. Yeah. Uh, we, it's not enough to say, well, I didn't do the right thing uh, because it, it might not matter. Yeah. You have to show it doesn't matter. Does it make sense? It's just an issue of professional responsibility. And sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, and that's because of, well, the generative model uh, saying that you could get away with the complete case analysis in the first place. Um, but you have to show it. The other effects, it does matter a little bit. And so there might be uh, something going on here that's worth following up on if you were really into this question. So the effect of M on B has gotten larger um, and uh, after imputation and the effect of uh, M uh, on body mass on group size has gotten a little bit smaller. And this has to do almost certainly with the non-random missingness uh, on these on these variables. This is the kind of thing, if I were interested in this sort of project, I would explore through synthetic data simulation to see the kinds of um, uh, biases that arise from complete case analyses when you have these uh, sorts of uh, sampling artifacts. At the bottom, we're showing the phylogenetic signatures, uh, so to speak, in these cases. And on the left, phylogenetic signature for brain size is very small. Uh, but remember, this is after accounting for the things in its equation, that is net um, uh, body, uh, body mass and uh, group size. There's essentially uh, almost no covariance among the brain sizes of primates after considering those things. And uh, then in the middle, um, uh, phylogenetic distance a kernel for body mass. Uh, so um, this has changed, yeah? And, and this is one of the things that changes the coefficients at the top uh, is that, that there's less phylogenetic signature after doing the, impl uh, the imputation. And uh, then on the right uh, for um, 
uh, group size, uh, the imputation leaves that essentially unchanged. So I hope I've convinced you that this is worthwhile, despite it being incredibly awkward. Uh, you learn things from the contrast between the complete case analysis and the imputation modeling, um, but it's also duty. Uh, the key idea here is uh, you already know things, or rather probability theory knows things about missing values. And it knows those things because you have taught it a generative model, and therefore it can deduce posterior distributions for the unobserved values. Yeah, If you believe the model you teach it, uh, then you can believe those distributions. But uh, remember, when we say we believe the model, this is a very small world statement. There's always model uncertainty that, at least in my opinion, cannot be uh, easily put under the umbrella of probability theory. Uh, there's a vast model space, um, uh, un, un, unimagined models still, and uh, it's a different kind of creative, really artistic exercise to come up with scientific models and interrogate them. And the little deductive part of the small world where we build posterior distributions from specific generative assumptions, that's indispensable. But we need to bounce back and forth between this, this highly uh, deductive and objective process of Bayesian updating and specific models and the more um, yeah, uh, uh, subjective uh, and imaginative uh, part of science, that is most of science, uh, which is theory construction and debate. Um, to build the small world part, uh, in, in this lecture we had another example of thinking like a graph. We had multiple equations, we used them simultaneously. Uh, so eventually, the, when you see enough of these examples, it starts to sink in, and it starts to seem natural to you. And doing isolated regressions, single equation regressions, will seem uh, very weird. Um, I hope this example also convinced you that imputation uh, of, of relationships among the predictors is a very good idea. If they're in your model and you start doing imputation, you probably want to start thinking like a graph immediately. Yeah, so that you're modeling the covariation among the predictors. And that'll give you um, partial pooling, in fact. I didn't make that point during the lecture, but it'll give you partial pooling among the imputations um, across the variables. And final thing, uh, even if it doesn't change the result, that doesn't mean you wasted your time because you did your duty. And uh, remember, do the analyses that you would like your colleagues to do. Yeah, you don't want your colleague to tell you that they didn't do something that they knew was the right thing to do because they thought it would be hard and it might not change the result. That's never a professional excuse. Okay, I hope that was useful and we're closing in on the end of this course. Next week, I will start off by talking about something I call generalized linear madness. Um, by that, I mean I will introduce scientific models which are not typical statistical models but actual scientific models based upon premises of the things we're modeling um, and i hope to see you there